there's something that's in all of our movies, all of our books, all of our music. It's the thing that captivates the minds of human beings. And oftentimes, it can drive people to do things that they normally wouldn't do. It can cause people to change their appearance. It can cause people to change the very course of their life. And even to actually lay down their life at times. And it's this concept called love. Love. You know, there was a Dutch man who I saw on the news was going to meet his girlfriend, traveled from Holland Airport, flew over to China to meet his girlfriend that he met online, but he's never met in person. And as he traveled there, he waited at the airport and she never showed up. For 10 days, this poor man refused to leave the airport. And as he did, he started to suffer physical exhaustion and then the ambulance had to come and take him away to the hospital because he just collapsed after being there emotionally and physically distraught for 10 days. Sad, and the woman never showed up. And you look at that, you're like, that's ridiculous. Why would that man do it? And at the same time, there's some of us that can recognize and kind of sympathize with the fact that love causes us to do, causes us to do strange and ridiculous things. It's in every movie plot that we enjoy. Every movie that you can think of that you've particularly enjoyed and it traps your emotions and almost causes you to be invested with it. Most of those movies are surrounding the, the plot of love. And I don't think it's a coincidence that some of the most popular songs today are things like Let Me Love You, where it's constantly the struggle of trying to realize love and not able to obtain it. And that's because people in general are obsessed with the idea of being in love. But I think that causes us to ask ourselves the question, and that question being, what is the meaning and the purpose of love? In other words, what is love for? What is marriage for? And these are questions that you may not particularly ask on a regular basis because you're so involved with the machinery of it, but not actually willing to ask those hard questions of what does it all mean and what is its purpose? But just like if you were to walk in a museum and you saw a beautiful display of art, most of us would look at that and ask the question, what does it mean? Now, it's always possible that someone just kind of randomly took some paint and just splattered it on the wall and said, ah, it doesn't really mean anything. It's just random. But if there is a purpose behind it, then I think that is something to be discovered. And so if you ask most people, looking at the institution of marriage and looking at the idea of love and ask the question, what is its purpose? Most people would say the reason why love exists and the reason why marriages exist, the purpose is to be happy. People look to be happy. That's why you pursue love. That's why you look for that relationship that you've been dreaming of all your life so that you can be happy. But is that the purpose? Well, I would actually venture to say that if you don't believe in God, I actually believe that it's possible that there is no actual objective meaning to love. And let me prove to you that case. You see, there's a view called materialism. And that's not talking about buy material objects and being obsessed with riches. Materialism is the view that the material world is the only world that exists. It's also called physicalism. And most people that believe in materialism, in other words, there are no things as souls, no things as spirits, there's no such thing as God. Most people on the materialist, neo-Darwinian view believe that love is actually just a chemical reaction in your brain. In other words, to ask the question of what is the purpose of love is a category mistake. In other words, you can't ask of the subject love what its purpose is because that is an intelligible, unintelligible uh, question to begin with. And so because love is reduced to just chemicals in your brain just reacting, it seems that the only reason why you pursue love is just because that's what your brain is wired to do and it feels good. In fact, an atheist, Sam Harris, would say this. Everything we do is for the purpose of altering consciousness. 
We form friendships so that we can feel certain emotions like love and avoid others like loneliness. So this atheist Sam Harris, who's a very prolific atheist in our world today, he would say that because you feel good when you love things, your, your brain is addicted to that chemical and that's all you're doing when you think that you're in love. And he would actually venture to say, as many other atheists would say, that if physicalism is true, materialism, then there's no such thing as free will. Because all the things that are happening in your brain are just chemical reactions. And there's no soul that's controlling it and interacting with your body and with your brain. So in other words, all of your behavior is just you watching it happen, but not you partaking in those actions. Because you are a product of your environment, and you're a product of the laws of nature, and in fact, the physical laws and the physical structure of your brain. This is what uh, Cornell University professor William Provine says. He says, free will, as traditionally conceived, simply does not exist. There is no way the evolutionary process as currently conceived can produce a being that is truly free to make choices. So in other words, for people that believe that the material world is all that exists and God doesn't exist, you don't have a soul in the strict sense, for those people, they would say that love is just a chemical reaction and marriage, it would seem to be an arbitrary institution. In other words, it's just a thing that animals do. But if you think about it, where in the animal kingdom do you see marriage? Why would animals have marital covenants that they're required to keep? Why would a gorilla feel the obligation to only remain with one spouse and that's it? And so it gets a little tricky. It seems that the reason why we have these contracts is simply because we're the highest evolved creature and we need it to benefit society and to raise children. But once again, if we're products of the environment, that doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just the way that it is because of our evolutionary biology. And maybe in a couple million years, if this is true, our bodies will evolve, our minds will evolve, and then we'll be in a completely different scenario where we don't even need marriage. So it seems like on that view, love is chemical reactions, marriage is just kind of an arbitrary institution, and we're just acting as our bodies demand. Because you feel a need for love, you act in such and such a way. But doesn't that kind of kill the magic of love? Doesn't that kind of kill the whole thing? Like even as I'm talking, you're just like, I, why, why am I here? This sounds depressing, and I don't even understand what he's saying. There's another atheist, Bertrand Russell, that talks about the complicated situation of trying to figure out ethics as it pertains to marriage, as it pertains to sex, without God. And he says, the difficulty of arriving at a workable sexual ethic arises from the conflict between the impulse to jealousy and the impulse to polygamy. In other words, as human beings, creatures, evolutionary creatures, he would say, that we're somewhere stuck in between we're jealous for our partners that cheat on us. At the same time, we feel like we need to be with other people because that's what our bodies tell us because you are attracted to a num number of people. But then why would you even stay with one person? Can't you just be with a lot of people? But then if you have a kid, you should have some responsibility to take care of that kid, right? We wouldn't just say that a father who has a kid with somebody and leaves a picture should have no responsibility to take care of that kid. We would say welfare should kick in. We should have some kind of, there should be some obligation for that father to care for the child as well. But if that's the case, then that means that the woman can't just go and sleep around with whoever she wants. And so Bertrand Russell says, this is a very complicated situation, and I, who knows what the answer is. Now, if you ask me, I have a simple answer. I would say that love seems to be something more than feelings. I think that makes sense. I don't know about you, but I think that makes sense. That love seems to be more than something that we feel. There's a, another philosopher from Baylor University, Alexander Pruss, and he says, basically, if love was just a feeling, here's the problem. As a married man, that would mean that every time my wife goes to sleep, she doesn't love me anymore because she doesn't have the feeling anymore as she goes to sleep. So her love is conditional on whether or not she's awake. That doesn't seem to make sense. Moreover, there's another philosopher. His name is Robert Nozick, and he has this thought experiment. He says this. 
let's say that you could develop this machine that produced whatever feeling you desire. And whatever feeling you desire, you could have it instantaneously by going into this machine. Well, if that was the case, most of us would still not want, if, for instance, you could have the sensation that you won a marathon. Most of us would not want that, right? We wouldn't want to just go to the machine and have the feeling of we won a marathon. We would actually want to win the marathon. And in the same way, if we could go into this machine and have the sensation of love, we still don't, wouldn't want that. We wouldn't just want the feeling of love. We actually want someone to love us. And so I think love is something more than feelings, something transcendent beyond human consciousness. And the Bible says so as well. This is what the Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 17. It says, The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. In other words, because love is transcendent, because God is love, it also means that marriage is something sacred and something beautiful. And I think when you reduce it to just feelings and this arbitrary contract, it completely ruins it. I mean, imagine if every Disney movie was rewritten to kind of portray what the evolutionary biologists are saying, atheistic evolutionary bi biologists. This is how it would look. Beauty and the Beast. There was once upon a time this girl who saw this beast and nothing happened because there was no chemical reactions in her brain. The end. <laughs> it's like, that sounds like a great movie. But maybe you're thinking this. Well, isn't the whole problem the fact that Disney has these romances that's that has this ideal that can't ever be actualized. Isn't that the problem with society? That they show us these things like the beauty loves the beast, but that never happens in reality. And because of that, we just find ourselves constantly depressed and it ruins every rela uh, relationship because you're constantly looking for an ideal that doesn't actually exist. So maybe you're thinking that. Like maybe it should be that way. Maybe Beauty and the Beast should be more about like this sad, boring story where nothing happens. But I would say this to you. The reason why relationships fall short of that ideal is not because there's no ideal. It's because people make the idol, make the entire point the relationship and nothing beyond the relationship. This is what a pastor, John Mark Comer, says. He says, marriage is a means to an end. It exists for friendship, yes, but also to partner with God for the remaking of shalom or peace. Couples who exist simply for one another are doomed to failure. If the point of your marriage is your marriage, it will collapse on itself. If the end of your relationship is your relationship, it will self-destruct. And so the exciting thing you see in the Bible is it also has these stories. Far greater stories of what love is truly to look like. And in fact... As we talked about the wisdom that comes from King Solomon, we talked about the book of Proverbs, we talked about the book of Ecclesiastes, there's actually one more book he's written, and it's the Song of Solomon, or also known as the Song of Songs. And in this book, maybe you'd expect him to give a whole bunch of his instructions on what love looks like, and instead he tells a story of this king, who's also a shepherd, who falls in love with this everyday average woman, who by every standard, should actually be ugly, should not be significant, but he falls in love, and this entire story is about marital bliss. And the interesting thing about this is as you take certain principles out of the book of Song of Solomon, is they say things like, do not stir up love until it pleases. In other words, there are some relationships worth waiting for. But the world wouldn't say that. The world would say, if you feel good about this situation, if you want something, you should just pursue it. But in fact, the story of the Bible is there are some relationships that we are destined for. There are some relationships that we are made to be in. And those relationships are the ones that are worth waiting for because the entire institution itself is sacred and a picture of God's love. And so as you enter into marriage, you're not just entering the relationship just to be in a relationship, just, not just because it feels good, but because the, the marriage and the relationship brings you to another place where you were not before. 
and it allows you to enter into a new dimension of God's love and also allows you to partake in his work. So look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, and you see the very first institution of marriage. And it says this, Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, the first man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, and this is where you get the principle of marriage. It says this, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. I love what uh, Pastor John Piper says about this. He says, God instituting marriage was the first father to give away the bride. And so the entire institution of marriage is something sacred in which you have the first man and the first woman, and they were at first one, and then he brought the woman out of the man. And because the man was alone, it was God who said it was not good, and he brought the woman to the man so that they could partake in God's work together. I mentioned before that this is all a picture of God's love. And that's why Ephesians in chapter 5 gives, gives its commentary on this very first story of love. It says Ephesians chapter 5 verse 28. Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Interesting. The Bible begins with marriage and ends with marriage. And the Bible often talks about the church being the bride of Christ. And so just as we get married on a human level, that is a picture of how God loves his people. Interesting, because that is a completely unique concept to Christianity. You see, the God of the Muslims, Allah, does not love anyone. In fact, this is what it says in the Quran. It says, by Allah, though I am the apostle of Allah, yet I do not know what Allah will do to me. That's Muhammad saying that. He says, although I'm Muhammad, I don't actually know what he's going to do with me. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I don't know if I'm going to hell. Even Muhammad the prophet. Later on, there was a woman who asked Muhammad, said, O apostle of God, is the one who is afraid of God the one who commits adultery, steals, drinks, wine, thus he is afraid of punishment? And Muhammad told her, No, O daughter, he is the one who prays fast and gives alms. Thus he is afraid that God may not accept these things from him. So Muhammad's saying, like, listen, the person who's afraid isn't the person who does bad things. It's the person who does all the right things and still is afraid that Allah will not accept him. But, as Alexander Pruss says, Christianity at base is a revealed religion of love. Love that. Christianity is a revealed religion of love. Jesus is the re revelation of God. I've had conversations with people before where they've, like even in the past week, as I'm out rock climbing, there's a guy who's talking about how, you know, if there's all these different religions, all these different gods, well, you don't know which one's right, but maybe God is in everything, you know? And you kind of like look in nature and like you could see there's some marks of his handiwork, but who knows who that is. And what I said is, you know, that could be true if God didn't choose to reveal himself. Everyone's guess would be up to them. Everyone would just be full of guesses as to who God is. But if in some point in history, God chose to reveal himself, 
then we have no choice but to accept him for who he is. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. It's to reveal the love of God by coming down to this world. As John 3, 16, the most popular verse in the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, oftentimes, isn't it true that what everyone wants at the deepest level is for someone to love us for who we really are? And not for what we do, not for what we look like, but we want someone to love us. But what's interesting about that is, even though we want someone to accept us, all of us act like other people. And we're constantly on our best behavior so that we are accepted. We're portraying ourselves as something that we're not. For instance, no one goes on Snapchat and posts terrible pictures of like average day life. Like you might pose goofy pictures, but even the goofy pictures that you post have to be acceptable before you send them. Oftentimes what people want to portray is the best of who they are, but no one wants to portray the worst of who they are. And at the same time, they want to be accepted for the worst of who they are. You know, according to Pew Research, right now the share of 18 to 24 year olds who use online dating has nearly tripled in the last two years. So online dating has skyrocketed in the past two years, tripled. And the number of people that are online daters that have asked someone else to help them with their profile is one in five. Where you make an online profile and then you're asking people like, do you think this is good? Do you think this picture is good? And they're getting advice so that they can put forth the best image and the best portrayal of who they are. And so maybe if you're going on a first date, you're talking to somebody for the first time, you're always trying to put your best foot forward. You don't want to do anything that might turn somebody off. And so you're always guarding yourself, right? Because you are always trying to measure up. You're always trying to impress somebody else. The difficulty with that is, once again, you feel like there could be a point in time in which someone sees you for who you really are and rejects you. So what do you do then? Well, this is actually how the Bible defines love. Get this. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it says, This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. You see, just as we try to portray ourselves in, a, in the best light to appease other people or to get people to like us, the thing is, what God wants from you is not your best behavior. He's not looking for your best performance. He's not looking for a fake. He's just looking for you and your heart. In fact, that's what God says in John chapter 4. He says that he's looking for genuine worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth. What's really funny is the stories that captivate us the most is once again the Cinderella stories. Right? There's Prince Charming who takes a delight in the one girl who's being mistreated by her brothers and sisters, which actually, what's really funny about that is that's the same case in the Song of Solomon. The Shulamite is being mistreated by her family members. And because she's working outside, she has a tan. And in those days, if you were really rich, you never had to go outside, and so you never had a tan. And if you had a tan, that meant that you were a worker, and that meant that you were probably poor. But this shepherd king took an interest in the Shulamite girl it's the same story as Cinderella in many ways. And that's what God is looking for. He's looking for you. Not because of what you do, but he loves you at the deepest fundamental level. And that's why he was willing to step down from heaven and enter our world to communicate that love for us. It's almost like that popular story, The Prince and the Pauper, where the rich prince trades places with this poor boy. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. You see, every great story is just borrowing from the Bible. Because each one is tugging at something that's important to all of us. And the fact is there is a God-shaped hole inside every one of us. Well, in conclusion tonight, I'd like to show you two ways 
that show that God's love is truly what we long for. Two ways that show that God's love is truly what we long for. Here's the first way. Number one, God loves us despite us. God loves us despite us. Oftentimes, human love those who we feel possess certain qualities that are worthy of our love. I heard a pastor say it this way. People have love that is object-oriented, and God's love is subject-oriented. Because you see, this roots all the way back to Aristotle. Because Aristotle would say things like, if people have certain attributes that we like, and they lose those attributes... It's completely reasonable to no longer love that person. And maybe you feel this way, like maybe the person's attractive, and then once upon a time, they, like, you just walk in the door, and like, you see them, and you're like, oh, they, they don't look good today. And for whatever reason, you're turned off. You don't want to talk to them anymore. Or maybe there's a person that you're looking to get something from, but you realize, oh, they're not that popular, and they're not that cool, so maybe I shouldn't hang around them anymore. And so because they lose those attributes, there's a lot of us that feel like, well, they're not worthy of our love, so I'm not going to talk to them. Because most of us would feel like if you love someone that everybody else thought was weird, it just feels like you're being too extravagant and you're wasting your time. I mean, whether we like it or not, our friends' opinions of the person that we're in love with really does affect us, doesn't it? Like if you're in love with somebody and then every one of your friends is like, really, them of all people, you're better than that. That affects you. But God's love is different because God loves even those that no one thinks is worth it. God loves the insignificant and makes them beautiful. This is what it says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. See, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Most people feel like they have to be a good person in order for God to love them, but it's actually the reverse. Because there are sins that you've done, there are wrongs that you've committed, that God loves you and forgives you for, that you don't even know that you've done. Well, here's the thing. I was talking to a friend even this past week, and she was saying to me, the concept that God loves the world, that God loves everyone, she said, doesn't that kind of diminish his love? I mean, no matter how many times you say that God loves everyone, doesn't it make you feel like, well, if God loves everybody, then how does he really love me? How does he love me in particular? How does he love me as an individual? Because everyone has their favorites. Everyone has the one person that they like more than other people, and there's got to be some people that God looks upon and says, yes, I love that person because they do this. And that person, eh, who really cares? And there's a part of us that almost feels like God must have favorites because how is it possible that God loves all? Well, when she said that to me, this is what I said. I said, all right, I'm going to ask you a question. What's your favorite song of all time? She said, oh, that's really hard. I said, why? Because Every song is different. It's hard to compare them to others. And you see, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You ever think about how God created human beings in the first place? What did he do? He breathed into what? Dust. Dust. Does anyone have a use for dust? Anyone at home, you have like dust sculptures. You like make dust instruments. No one does anything with dust. In fact, you have dusters to get the dust out of your house. Yet God loves to breathe into the insignificant and create life. And if you feel insignificant, he can do that with you as well. The Bible all throughout shows that he loves individuals that Jesus met with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He met with Nicodemus at night. You see, God is always about the individual. Even as Jacob felt like an outcast and he was running away from his brother Esau and he was going out to a land that he didn't know, 
There God met him. And what did Jacob say? Surely the Lord was in this place and I did not know it. And perhaps you're here tonight and you feel like you're unloved. And the good news for you is that God is in this place. And all you have to do is turn your eyes upon Jesus and he will forgive you of your sins. And he will show you the love that you've always dreamed of and you've always longed for. The second way that God shows us that his love is the thing that we've truly longed for is that God's love casts out fear and shame. God's love casts out fear and shame. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Oftentimes, as you're in a relationship, people have insecurities because they feel like there's a part of themselves that they can't really ever show to somebody else. Because if they did, it would repulse them, as I spoke about before. But the thing is, when God loves you, he loves every part of you. Because it's not about what you've done or who you are now, but who he's making you to be. As you're conformed into the image of Jesus. As you become more and more like his son. You see, God loves you. And as he loves you, it's not like he loves some parts of you, but he loves every single part of you. There's actually a story in the Bible, in the book of Hosea, as there's a prophet who's told to go marry a prostitute. And I think if that was any of our mission in life, most of us would not sign up for that. And the reason why he was told is really interesting. Because he's told to go love a prostitute that would not love him back to show his love for the people of Israel. To show the love of God for his people. And the thing, what happened is, Hosea, though he had married this prostitute, the prostitute actually sold herself into slavery. And then Hosea was told to go and buy her back. He had to buy back his own wife, the mother of his children. And he did, to show how, as the people that are living in this planet, we have sold ourselves into sin and God himself, though, we, though he did not have to do anything, he chose to come into our world and purchase us back because we were not able to do that ourselves. And so if you ever feel like you have shame, there's areas that you're afraid of people knowing. If there's things about you that you feel like if only people knew, then they wouldn't want to be my friend. Well, here's the, here's the good news. That perfect love can cast out all fear because you don't have to worry about on the day of judgment telling God things he doesn't know. But he loves you so very much. Romans chapter 8 verse 38 says this, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Throughout the Bible, you see things like God tells the story of the prodigal son. When, the, when there was a son who said, give me my inheritance and, and divide it up, and he went and spent all that he had, the father had been waiting. And the minute that this prodigal son recognized after he was bankrupt, after he was selling himself into slavery, eating with the pigs, he remembered how good it was to be in the father's house. And he went back and the father ran out, even though old men didn't run in those days. It was a shameful thing. He ran out, didn't care, and wrapped him in, in the robes of a king because he loved him. And that's the way our God is. If there's any willing to come to him, he would forgive. But this is, this is what's really important. God's love is not a concept to be admired. It's a reality to be felt. Do you know the love of God? Because here's the thing. All of us want to be loved, right? Y'all, most of you probably want to get married at some point. And then when we think of the love of God, it's almost like we've, we've kind of like eclipsed it. Because we've made marriage such a huge thing in our, in our heads. But it's the reverse. That marriage is only a tiny glimpse of the love that God has for us. And the relationship we can enter into. But do you know the love of God? Have you felt it? Have you felt what it's like to be accepted 
by God. Because here's the thing. Although God loves the world, the question is, will you receive that love? His love is available to all. And Jesus does love all. But the question is, will you enter into that marriage? Will you choose to accept Jesus to make him the Lord of your life? Because saying yes to Jesus, just like in marriage, means you're also saying no to everything else that demands your worship. And that's the part that people don't like. Because when you choose to enter into this relationship with Jesus, as he gives you his love, that means you're not going to go off and worship other gods. And I'm not talking about figurines or statues, but I'm talking about the gods of money, the gods of relationship, the gods of success. Things that demand your love, demand your worship, demand your time. When the thing that you're really looking for is only found in Jesus. In John chapter 14 verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. But that means that you have to admit certain things. To be able to feel the love of Christ, that means that you have to recognize that you are first and foremost a sinner. That you, you have gone the wrong way. That you have pursued the wrong things. That you've taken a good thing that God's given you in creation and made it everything. And to say, God, I don't know what I'm doing. And I want you to be the Lord of my life. And if he's Lord, that means you're a servant. And that means that you will obey his commands. Obeying his commands aren't required for salvation, but if you're going to be a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus, that means that you are making it your aim to please him with your life. Just like in marriage. In marriage, it's never about, because I, when I was on the plane this past week in Colorado, I was sitting next to a person who is uh, a professed Christian, and she was drinking wine, and so she saw me reading the Bible, and then she just kind of asked me, she said, oh, were you reading? And I said, I'm reading the Bible. She said, Can I read that after you're done? I'm like, sure. So she's reading, and then as she's drinking and reading, she asked me the question. She says, so do you think it's wrong for Christians to drink? I'm like, well, you're putting me in an awkward situation right now. I said, no, it's not wrong for Christians to drink. The Bible says it's wrong to be drunk, but you're asking the wrong question. See, the question is never about what can I get away with, what's right and what's wrong. The question is, how can I please the Lord with my life? Just like in marriage, and Pastor Lloyd says this all the time, that in marriage you don't say, so how much can I cheat on you before you leave me? No, like who would ask that, right? You, just, you don't even think in terms like that. Like, is this cheating? Is this wrong? If I, talk to other, if I text other girls, is that fine? You don't think in terms of like that. All you think of is how can I please the one that I love? And here's the thing. Pleasing the Lord is never about just restraining your desires and killing your passions and like be miserable the rest of your life. But you find out the love of God is far greater than anything else the world has to offer. In fact, the Bible says that all the world offers you is just hunger pains, just cravings. It fills up your stomach with growling, but it never actually satisfies you. But the love that God has, Jesus said, out of his heart would come torrents of living water. He said to the woman at the well, listen, you can drink from the other wells if you like, but if you drink of the water I give you, you'll never thirst again. Isn't that what you want? To be able to say, I have no need of anything. As Paul the Apostle said, listen, I could be in prison, I could be in a palace, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How can he say that? Because he's found the secret of contentment. Because he knows that Christ is with him wherever he goes. That he doesn't have to be married to be a whole person. That he doesn't have to be successful to be a whole person. He doesn't have to portray certain attributes. He doesn't have to get 200 likes on Instagram. He doesn't have to do anything because God loves him and accepts him for who he is right then and there. Because his identity is found in Christ and not in the things that he does. And so my invitation is for you this evening. If you would like to enter into that 
relationship with Jesus, maybe for the first time, we're going to give you an invitation right now. So why don't we pray? Thank you for joining us at Impact High School Youth Group, a ministry of Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge. You've been watching Old Like Logic, a special series intended to show how Christianity is contemporary and its text timeless. If you're interested in learning more about God, you can go to knowgod.org. Or if you're interested in learning about more about our group, you can go to impactaworld.com. Thank you and God bless you today.